Welcome to another exciting podcast of Royal Oak Victory Church. We're glad you've joined us. We are a community devoted to God, connected to others, and influencing our world. Well, you know, we're in for a real treat today. Um, It was several months ago we were uh, gathered together. We have a, a, a sermon design team, actually that helps kind of prepare, not the sermons, but the the kinds of series, sermon series, uh, that we want to uh, present and preach and uh, introduce to the body life of the church. And so it was a couple months ago, we were sitting around, we were thinking, you know, what what, what might be a good topic that we might uh, talk about as a church? And, you know, the, 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 the topic of the last days came up, you know, the end times. How many think we're living in the end times? If you don't believe it, we're closer now than we were yesterday. That's one thing. Amen. And so we talked about that, how, you know, you can't turn on the, the, the news, you can't go on the Internet, you can't pick up a newspaper without saying some of the headlines are saying, wow, you know, seems like we're in the last days. And so we talked about, you know, that would be an awesome sermon series. Um, and, you know, they kind of looked at me and said, you know, Pastor, would you preach that? And I thought, well, you know, it has not been. Although it's a, a very passionate area, it's not been an area that I've ever really studied that much on or preached on. You know, it's just, I just haven't uh, put a lot of uh, effort in that area. And so we thought about who might we, we be able to bring in to, 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 to do that. And um, we realized that we have someone right in our own congregation who specializes in last days. And uh, he heads up our uh, Bible college. He's the dean of our Victory Bible College. Uh, But not only that, I mean, end times has been his passion and focus of study for many years. Many years. Matter of fact, he has just written a book. It's just come from the publisher. And uh, I understand that it'll be here. We'll be able to sell it next next Sunday, I believe. Um, uh, It's just hot off the press. And so for the next couple Sundays today... And next Sunday, we're, we're doing a mini-series um, called um, Earth's Final Hour. And, of course, uh, the person who's going to deliver it is none other than one of my favorite teachers and preachers, and that's Dr. Ron Swanson. So why don't you give him a big hand as he comes? Bless you. Well, good morning. How's everybody doing today? Ready for the word? All right. Well, it's a joy to be with you again, and a double joy to actually have my book released right in my home church, which is great. Um, We will have it here, as Pastor Dave said. We'll have it here next week. And we're actually going to give you uh, uh, actually a deal on it. Usually it goes for $14.99. We'll be selling it for $9.99. So such a deal. You come back when you want to buy. And uh, it's going to be a great Christmas gift, and uh, I'm really excited about the release. So... Again, thanks, Pastor Dave, for the opportunity to share and to release the book here. Now, what I'm going to do, we've called this the title of the same title as the book. It's called Earth's Final Hours. And I'm going to give you just, I want to start off today by giving you just a little bit of an outline of where we're going to go over the next couple of weeks. Um, Today, what we're going to do is we're going to be looking at the signs of the times. We're going to actually take the Bible in one hand, the newspaper in another, and I want to show you some examples of fulfilled prophecy. Now, again, sometimes when people think of, you know, signs of the times, you know, the first thing that comes to mind is earthquakes. And, and, you know, I've heard people say, well, you know, earthquakes, I know Jesus mentioned it, but, you know, really, we've always had earthquakes. And, you know, to that, we always respond, well, yeah, but, you know, Jesus called them birth pangs. They get more frequent and more intense as the time draws closer. But I've never actually had that, any, you know, satisfy anybody, you know, if they were a real skeptic. So what I want to do today is I want to look at some things that are so specific that it would be impossible for them to be a coincidence. Now, the thing about the signs of the times is, well, I I don't want to say that yet. I'll I'll come back to that in just a moment. Um, What I want to do is we're going to look at the signs of the times today, and then next time what we're going to do is we're going to come back and we'll look at sort of a chronology of end time events. So we'll go ahead, and there's going to be a lot of information here. I'm going to give you a little bit of a warning up front. It might feel like I'm giving you a drink from a fire hose. All right. In fact, I'm going to be right up front with you. I've got 13 points. Nobody's moving toward the exit. That's good. But a lot of these are going to be really short. We're not going to spend a lot of time. 
But what I want to do is I want to equip you over the next couple of weeks. I'm going to try to fit as much as I can of end times knowledge into your repertoire. So when you go to witness to somebody, I mean, it is such a great opportunity and such a great tool for when you go to witness to somebody. If you can say, well, the Bible said this, and look, you can't deny this. It's actually coming to pass. So again, that's what we're going to do over the next couple of weeks. So let's go ahead and let's dive right into this. And I want to start just by defining Bible prophecy. Now, you're going to feel like you're in Bible school. Like I said, there's going to be a lot of information, a lot of points, but it really will equip you. Now, what is prophecy? Well, prophecy, I like this definition of prophecy. Really, prophecy is history written in advance. In other words, God tells us what's going to happen before it happens. Now, why would he do that? Well, I want to give you a couple of reasons. The first reason I think he does that is it really does give us confidence that the rest of the book is true. I mean, stop and think it out for a moment. If you could point out, if God could show us this, 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 and this is going to happen, and then out here in the natural, you see all those things come to pass, it's got a twig in your thinking, oh my goodness, more than just men wrote this book. There must be someone, a higher power, God himself, behind the writing of this book. And really, that's what Jesus said over in John 14, 29. He said, now I've told you before it comes to pass that when it does come to pass, you might believe. And, you know, I've seen this happen in my own life. I've seen it happen time after time. Like I said, it's such a great witnessing tool. And even Dr. George, I mean, he's so passionate about end times because he says the thing that really convinced him, I mean, he was trying really hard to go to hell. He was really trying to be lost and try to not get saved. But somebody confronted him with what the Bible said about end times, and he said it was undeniable. I just, I couldn't do anything about it. So again, he did believe, and that's what Jesus intends for us to do. So I said, one of the things end time prophecy does is it really helps us understand the whole book is true. God's behind this. Now, before we get into what we're going to talk about, talking about prophecies of the second coming, I want to talk a little bit about some of the prophecies God gave concerning Jesus' first coming. You know, Christmas is just around the corner, and, you know, we think of the babe in Bethlehem. That's the Lord's first coming. Well, in that first coming, I don't know whether you knew this or not, but in his first coming, Jesus fulfilled 324 prophecies. 324. That's a lot of prophecies to fulfill, to all come to pass through one person. Now, I did a little bit of digging on the Internet. You know, I wanted to know if there was any statistics of probabilities for fulfilling that many. I couldn't find anything on the internet for 324. But according to the American Scientific Affiliation, they got together and said, well, let's just pick eight of these. So they picked, you know, where he was born, how he was going to die, some of those things. And they said, what would be the probability of one person fulfilling eight of these prophecies? They came up with the probability as being one in a hundred quadrillion to fulfill eight. Now, that's hard to wrap our brains around. I mean, that's a huge number. I mean, we don't usually think in terms of 100 quadrillion. So so they gave us a couple of things that might help us understand just a little bit better. They said it would be the same odds as if you took the whole state of Texas, filled it, completely covered it with silver dollars two feet deep. If you put an X on one of those, mixed it all in, dropped a guy out of a helicopter in a parachute, blindfolded him, let him wander around the whole state, and then he bent over and picked up one. If he got that one that you'd put the X on, that would be one in 100 quadrillion. Now, that's some odds. That's some odds. Now, you know, I I thought, well, that helped me a little, you know, but it was still a little bit blind to me. So I did a little bit more digging, and I found out uh, there's actually a website called The Penny Project. And the whole point of this Um, whole website is to help us understand really, really big numbers and to understand probabilities. So they used this example, and I think this will make it visual for us. But it, it was giving the probability of, you know, it started really low. And they said, well, if we had 16 pennies and we spray painted one of them red, dumped them in a sack, shook up the sack, let you stick your hand in, pull out one penny, your chances of getting the red one would be one in 16, right? So again, they moved from 1 in 16 up to 1 in 1,000, and that is what 1,000 pennies looks like. So again, if you had one penny that was red, your chance of getting that penny would be 1 in 1,000. Now we jump up to the next one, which is 1 in a million. Did you ever wonder what a, what a million pennies looked like? Well, it would create a little wall here, 5 feet high, 4 feet wide, and a foot thick, and that is a million pennies. 
Now let's take a huge jump to 200 billion. You want to see what 200 billion, who does stuff like this? Somebody with a whole lot more time than I've got. But somebody actually figured out what 200 billion pennies would look like. There it is. Now you may not be able to see the little man standing there from where you are, so I put a little arrow there. And there's a fella standing there. That's 200 billion pennies, and it covers a football field 127 feet high. Again, if you had one little red penny, that'd be one in 200 billion. Ready to make the jump to a quadrillion? This is one quadrillion pennies. Over on the left, we've got the tallest building at the time, the Sears Tower. Beside it, you've got the Eiffel Tower. I was kind of hoping for a little picture of King Kong, but it just wasn't there. And then way over on the right, you can see that tiny little green square. That's the football field. And that is over half a mile high. Now that's one quadrillion. Now make 100 piles that same size, put the red penny in there, that's one in 100 quadrillion to fulfill eight prophecies. Now let's take, now the word, uh, the, the number 100 quadrillion, I didn't point it out before when it was on the screen, but it's one with 17 zeros behind it. One with 17 zeros. That's for eight prophecies. Let's jump now to 48. Suppose they said, well, one fella, he's got to fulfill 48 prophecies. The chances of that are one in, good luck on that. I don't even know what that is. I don't know if anybody knows what that is. That's one with 158 zeros behind it. Now, to bring that into perspective, they say that is a, pro now, I don't know who counted, but they, obviously it's just an estimate, but they say that's about the number of electrons in the known universe. So go anywhere in the known universe, pull out an atom, put one little electron, make it red, and then put Buzz Lightyear out there looking for it. And again, if you got it on the first try, that would be one in whatever that number is. Now here's the thing. Jesus didn't fulfill eight prophecies. He didn't fulfill 48. He fulfilled all 324. What are the chances of that? Again, God wrote the book, and God has a track record when it comes to prophecy. He really does. So again, the first reason I said prophecy is important is it helps us realize that God wrote the book and gives us confidence that the rest of the book is true. But then it also gives us an indication of how close we are to his coming. I mean, years ago, I remember back in the 70s, I got saved in 1978, and I started to read a little bit about prophecy, and they'd mention, you know, world currency and all this stuff. And, you know, I remember I was just 15 years old, but I'd watch the national news every night hoping to see something fulfilled. And I'd watch the news the next day, and the next day, and the next month. And finally, I just got tired of it because I thought if anything's being fulfilled, I don't know it, you know? And, but now, my goodness, you can hardly turn on the television set without seeing something fulfilled. And again, it gives us an indication that we're getting closer and closer and closer. Now, there's a verse over here, and we'll just read it to you out of Matthew 16. Jesus is speaking here with the Pharisees. It says, the Pharisees also with the Sadducees came and tempting desired him that he would show them a sign from heaven. Show us a sign to prove this is real. He answered and said unto them, When it's evening, you say it'll be fair weather, for the sky is red. And in the morning, it'll be foul weather today, for the sky is red and threatening. Oh, you hypocrites, you can discern the face of the sky, but can you not discern the signs of the times? In other words, we ought to be able to look just like a weather forecaster would look at all his instruments and look at the clouds and look at all the things that are happening in the natural and be able to forecast what's going to happen the next day in the weather. And sometimes they get it and sometimes they don't. But with us, he said, you ought to be able to look at the signs of the times in my word and realize, boy, we're getting close. Now, what I want to do, again, I said you might feel a little bit fire-hosed here, but we're going to dive into this. I'm going to give you 13 points and these are going to be, again, as specific as I can get them, signs that couldn't be a coincidence. And again, I believe we're going to be able to see, wow, we really are close. Well, the first sign I want us to look at, this is the sign of false Christs. Now, this one's real familiar. We're going to take a little bit of time, but not too much time on this. The prophecy is actually from Matthew 24, verse 5. And this was written about 1970 years ago. It says, for many will come in my name, saying, I am Christ, and will deceive many. Now, there's two things I want you to notice there. He said people would come in his name saying, I'm him, I'm Christ, and then many would be deceived. Now, I'm going to ask you a question. I asked this in the first service. I saw a couple of hands. But how many people in here have ever had anybody tell you, I'm Jesus Christ? Yeah, there's, there's a few hands here, a few more in the second service. I've had a few people, 
you know, the odd person, they'd, you know, wander up and tell me they're Jesus. And, uh, you, know, I, you know, I always said, well, work a miracle for me. Nobody ever did. But, you know, back in the day, I mean, we didn't see a lot of that. Now it's getting more and more common. Now, I, I could put up a lot of screens here. I'll just give you a couple. Here's one from this fellow's website. Now, how's this for something on your website? I mean, talk about giving yourself a title. He says, don't miss God himself in his second coming in a city near you. <laughs> Apostle in God, that's what he titles himself. Apostle in God, Dr. Do Dr. Jose Luis de Jesus Miranda, touring the, the continent, renewing your understanding, zama, 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 and oh, by the way, I'm Jesus. And again, he talks about how I am Jesus in the second coming, you know? And surprisingly, he got, you know, a fair amount of people following him. You know, and I said I could put up a lot of guys like this, but let's just cut to the chase here. This is from the BBC News website. It says, Holy Land Overwhelmed with Messiahs. And if you were to read down through that, it says that over 40,000 people a year show up in the Holy Land saying, hello, I'm Jesus. 40,000 a year. You didn't think there'd be that many confused people. 40,000. Now, would you agree that's many? He said many would come in my name saying. So I, I think that's many. But then notice the second part of that. I said it, not only were many saying it, but many were believing it and being deceived. Now, I'm going to ask you another question. If somebody walked up to you today and said, hi, I'm Jesus Christ, just want you to know, no, I'm Jesus, how many in here would be deceived? Right. How many do you think of your unsaved friends would be deceived? Still not very many. You know, more likely they're going to call the loony bin, right? So again, there's a lot of people saying it, not a whole lot of people being deceived. So I wonder, could there be some other fulfillments of this? Well, I think certainly there could be. You know, up here I've got three possibilities. The first one is people come up and say, hi, I'm Jesus Christ the person. But then what if we included the New Age movement in this? Because see, one of their catchphrases is Christ in you, the hope of glory. But their Christ is not our Christ. See, they talk about the Christ principle. And again, the Jesus, you know, of Nazareth, you know, he wasn't God, according to the, the New Age movement. Really what he was is he was just a fellow who tapped into this Christ principle, became one of the ascended masters and all of these things. But again, you know, you read some of their books and they'll say things as, you know, like this. Was Jesus the Christ? Well, of course he was. We're all Christ. Well, if you take that into consideration, that brings up the number of people saying it way higher. Also, it brings up the number of people being deceived by it a lot higher. And then the final way I guess we could look at this is notice he didn't say, Many will come in my name saying, I'm Jesus. He said, they'll come saying, I'm Christ. Well, Christ means the anointed one. So, you know, I've read books where they took this view of it, and I think it's legitimate, that, uh, you know, possibly that means many would come in my name, in my authority, saying, I'm anointed. And again, they're preaching total heresy, but again, they're deceiving many. So if you put all of those together, I think we came up with a pretty good fulfillment there. Would you agree with that? So that's the first one, false Christs. The second sign I want to point to is an anti-Christian society. Now, how many have been saved like me 35 years or more? You're dating yourselves. Now, would you agree? You know, I, I talk to a lot of young people. I deal with the Bible college all the time. I'm the dean there. And, you know, I deal with a lot of young people, and all they know about Christianity is what you see right now. But really, things have really, really changed over the last 35 years. They really have and the, the, the society as a whole has become way more anti-Christian, anti-Christ than it ever was back in the day. Now, one of the signs he said would happen is before the appearance of the person, the Antichrist, he said there'd be a spirit of Antichrist that would permeate society and become greater and greater so as to prepare the world to receive the Antichrist, the person when he comes. Now, John spoke of this back way, way, way back in his first epistle. 1 John 4, 3, he said, this is that spirit of Antichrist. Where have you heard that it should come? And even now, already is it in the world. So it's been in the world since at least John's time. But again, the concept is it becomes more and more prevalent as we go. That particular verse we just looked at, that was about 1920 years ago that that was written. Let's back up and jump back actually 3,500 years to the second psalm. Because the psalmist is going to give us the same concept of a world that doesn't want Jesus Christ or his influence in the world. 
Now it says here in Psalm, uh, sorry, this is Psalm 2, verse 1. It says, why do the heathen rage and the people imagine a vain thing? Now, the vain thing they're imagining is they can do life without God. They don't need God. So it says, why do the heathen rage or the pe people imagine a vain thing? The leaders of the earth take a stand and its famous people are united in their purpose against the Lord, that'd be Jesus, and against his anointed, that'd be the church. Now, now listen to what they're saying. They're, they're gathering against the Lord and his anointed saying, let us free ourselves from their rule and let us throw off their control. Now, has anybody seen any of that? You know, again, it's not so much that they mind us meeting here within these four walls as long as we stick to ourselves and be quiet and shut up and don't bother them. But as far as society goes, they don't want our influence at all. They don't want the Lord's influence. They don't want our influence. They're saying, let us throw off their rule, throw off their control. We don't want Christianity. And again, we could show you slide after slide of things. I mean, there's a lot of things I just couldn't show you. It's become so blatantly antichrist. But I want to bring up just three slides here, three or four, and, and I think this demonstrates the concept of how society is moving. This is actually from a few years back. It's back in 2010. But the, if you look about halfway down, the, the headline reads, Florida school tries to ban Bibles on Religious Freedom Day. Religious Freedom Day, you can bring anything, but I don't want to see that Bible in there. Here's another one. If you look under that blue graphic, it says, principal and athletic director face criminal charges for prayer at a luncheon. They actually just prayed over the food out loud, and they were charged, believe it or not, with criminal contempt. Isn't that crazy? Go a little bit further here. I'll give you one more. Here's one from World Net Daily. It says, home is no place for Bible study. Now, I want to read uh, just a little bit of this. It's out of San Diego. It says, a San Diego pastor and his wife claim they were interrogated by a county official and warned they will face escalating fines if they continue to hold Bible studies in their home. Do you have a regular weekly meeting in your home? Do you sing? Do you say amen? The official reportedly asked. Do you say praise the Lord? Oh, can you imagine somebody doing all the? I mean, we, singing and saying amen and praying. You'd think it was a crime. But again, the whole society is moving that direction. Uh, I will move quickly off this one because we could spend a lot of time there. But again, we see an anti-Christian society more and more. The next thing I'll bring up is anti-Semitism. That's being against the Jew. Now, I've said to the Bible school students here just recently, I think you can tell a lot of what's true by just looking at what the devil fights at. Do you ever think of that? I mean, think about this for a minute. When was the last time somebody, you were working with somebody on some kind of building project, they hit their thumb with a hammer and they said, oh, Buddha. <laughs> oh, Confucius. No. You know, who, who are they aiming at? Jesus. And, you know, I mean, this is an age of tolerance, but for everybody, it's tolerant for everybody but the Jew and the Christian. Should tell you something. We're open game. Now, we're going to spend a little bit of time talking about the Jews here. Because there's, there's actually about three things I want to bring out. Some major prophecies here. And, and this one, this first next one I'm going to bring out, um, is actually the, the restoration of Israel as a nation. Now, most of us in here are not old enough to remember a pre-Israeli world. I mean, I was born in 1962. And, you know, I just wasn't around in 1948 and before that. All I ever have known is Israel being a nation. And, I mean, it's been in the news ever as long as I can remember. But, you know, I have known people through the years that, that remember that time. You know, most of you know Pastor Craig Broker from the Southside Church. I was talking to his mom once when she was still living, and she said she was sitting in Bible school the day Israel became a nation. And she said the prof walked in and he said, we are in the last days. A major Bible prophecy has been fulfilled. Now to us, we, we hardly blink at that. We don't even think much about that because that's all we've ever known. But for almost 2,000 years, there was no Israel. Now let me read you just, again, this is a prophecy from 2,700 years ago. Let me read a couple of verses. This one's from Ezekiel 20. God promises here, remember they had been scattered God says, I will bring you out from the people. I'll gather you out from the countries wherein you've been scattered with a mighty hand and with a stretched out arm. Isaiah 66, 8 says, who's heard such a thing? Who has seen such things? Shall a land be born in one day or shall a nation be brought forth in a moment? And again, I've got one picture here. 
Uh, there's certain things I can't put up because of copyright laws. But again, if you just Google Israel becoming a nation, you can see the, the historic moment that Israel became a nation, exactly like God said, in a day, in a moment. And again, it happened just like God said. So that's one of the big things about Israel. Another thing I'll bring up is from Psalm 83. Now, one of the things in Psalm 83 that's prophesied about this restored, restored Israel is that there would be in the last days a group of nations surrounding Israel that was dedicated to Israel's destruction. Now, look at how violent they are here. It says here in Psalm 83, they have said, come and let us cut them off from being a nation. We don't even want them to exist. That the name of Israel be no more in remembrance, for they have consulted together with one consent, their confederate against thee. In other words, there's a bunch of nations surrounding Israel all together saying, we don't want them to exist. Well, I'll just put up a couple of slides here. Here's from the blaze. It says, wipe them off the face of the earth. Iran issues a new threat to Israel. And again, here's another headline. It says, kill all the Jews and annihilate Israel. See, they don't want peaceful coexistence. They want Israel gone. And again, that was prophesied way back in Psalm 83. But now I'm going to bring you, now we've talked about a couple of things with Israel, them becoming a nation, them having hostility around them. Here's probably one of the greatest things I've seen in, in recent times. And we're going to talk here about another thing with Israel. Has anybody ever heard of the two-state solution? Two-state solution? They say, really, you know, there's a lot of nations saying this. In fact, I could probably name you about 30. But, but they're saying that one of the ways we can solve the problems in the Middle East, we could solve the whole thing if we just created a Palestinian state, we divided the land, we divide Israel, we divide Jerusalem, we make a Palestinian state, and, you know, that's their plan for, you know, peace. Here's the problem. God doesn't like that. See, the land belongs to Israel. God gave it to them way, 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 way back, you know, as far as Abraham, and he, you know, that was God's promise. And God does not like it when you divide the land of Israel. In fact, according to Joel 3, 2, this is the thing that triggers Armageddon in the mind of God. Now, look what this says over in Joel 3, 2. Again, we're talking about dividing the land. This is so specific. It says here, this is God speaking. He said, I will gather all nations and will bring them down into the valley of Jehoshaphat, where the battle of Armageddon happens. So God said, I'll bring them all down to the battle of Armageddon, and there I'll deal with and execute judgment upon them for my treatment of my people, for their treatment of my people, of my heritage Israel. Now, why did God bring them down to judge them? Because they've divided my land. Two-state solution. Now, again, he said it was because they divided the land. Let me just throw up a few things here. Here's one headline. It says, official Obama administration sees Jerusalem divided. We'll start at the left and go clockwise. Sarkozy says Jerusalem should be divided. The UN chief says, end the illegal occupation. That makes me so mad when they talk about it. It's not an illegal occupation. It's their land. God gave it to them. But he says again, end the occupation, divide Jerusalem. Europe seeks to divide Jerusalem. Foil the Swedish plan to divide Jerusalem. I could name you easily 30 nations that are all saying the same thing. Divide Jerusalem. Will it happen? Absolutely. But in the mind of God, that's what's going to trigger the battle of Armageddon. Is that specific or what? Not only they're talking about dividing the land, but it says Obama promises the Arabs that Jerusalem will be theirs. I don't know how you give away somebody else's capital city. <laughs> but evidently, you read the article and it says what you know, Israel says about it doesn't matter, Hamas is saying. They're saying it doesn't matter. What we're going on is what we were promised by Obama. <sighs> All right. So again, we've got some things going here. We've talked about false Christ and anti-Christian society, anti-Semitic. We talked about the reestablishment of Israel, a group of nations surrounding Israel dedicated to her destruction, the dividing of the land. Let's move over and talk about the temple. Now, I want to give you a, a website. If you want to write this down, you can go look at this. They're really, really, really particular about copyright laws and projecting images and that. So I wasn't able to get the permission to do this. But if you went to the temp, sorry, it's called thetempleinstitute.org. Thetempleinstitute.org. And if you look that up, they've got a lot on there about the concept of the rebuilding of a temple. Now, why is that important? Because 2 Thessalonians 2.4, talking about the Antichrist, says this. It talks about the Antichrist who opposes and exalts himself 
above all that is called God or all that is worshipped, so that he, as God, sits in the temple of God, showing himself that he is God. So in the midpoint of the tribulation, the Antichrist walks in the temple, says, I'm God, worship me. Now, does anybody see a problem with that being fulfilled right now? There's no temple, right? Yet. Now, let me put up a couple of articles. Now, these are back from about 2005, 2006. It's when this started. But it says, Sanhedrin launched in Tiberias. A unique ceremony, probably only the second of its kind in the past 1,600 years, is taking place in Tiberias today, the launching of a Sanhedrin, the highest Jewish legal tribunal in the land of Israel. So they've reestablished the Sanhedrin. Saul of Tarsus actually sat on that at one point, so I mean, it's, we're talking old here. Now, they've got the Sanhedrin back. First thing they start to talk about is new Sanhedrin plans, the rebuilding of the temple. Now, the reason I gave you the templeinstitute.org is you can go on that website and you can see all the blueprints. They're all there. They've got all the utensils of worship made. They've got the garments made for the priest and the high priest. They've got all of that sitting there. Now, I said they've got blueprints. I can't project it, but let me read this. It says, the plans you're viewing on this page fulfill every requirement necessary for the immediate commencement of work on this aspect of the Holy Temple complex. In other words, it's all sitting there. We're just waiting for the go-ahead. Wow. So again, will there be your temple? Absolutely. Now, as long as we're talking about the temple, we might as well talk about the red heifer. Now, let me read this article. It says, the Temple Institute in Jerusalem announced that Israel now has a qualified red heifer of the third year for the needed sacrifice to purify Israelis from contact with a dead body. Israel has not had such a red heifer since the temple era ended in 70 AD. Now, let me just give you the quick version of this. From Moses up until 70 AD when the temple was destroyed, they only were using ashes from 10 red heifers. That's all they needed. So they'd killed 10 red heifers. They, they had the ashes there, and that's what they used. Now, when the temple was destroyed in 70 AD, it's odd. I mean, red heifers just stopped being produced. In fact, here's the thing. They're so rare. I mean, they've got so many stipulations about this. I mean, you have to take that red heifer, you've got to put it aside for three years, and you've got to watch. And if one hair is a different color, you can't use that one, he's disqualified. Like I said, there were only 10 from Moses to the, to the destroying of Herod's temple there in 70 AD. Now, though, they haven't had a red heifer that qualified since 70 AD until now. Think we're getting close? Again, so much is lining up. So again, that's the temple. Okay, the next thing we'll look at is we're going to talk about a revived empire. Now, I used to call this the revived Roman Empire, but lately, tell you the truth, I'm not 100% sure whether it's going to be a revived Rome. Really, there's a couple of theories out right now. They both make total sense. But before we give you the two theories, let me talk to you a little bit about the concept. Now, the concept is that there's going to be a huge empire, a Gentile empire that existed in the past that goes out of existence and then it'll come back and be resurrected and that's what the Antichrist will rule over, all right? So again, it's going to be a revived whatever empire that is. Now, I said most people for years have taught that it's a revived Roman empire and the reason they did that is out of Daniel 9.27, it says that the people of the prince that would come, the Antichrist, the people of the Antichrist, would be the ones that would destroy the temple in 70 AD. So we looked at that and we said, well, who destroyed the temple in 70 AD? It was Titus, the Roman general. So the Romans destroyed the temple, so it must be a revived Roman empire that the Antichrist is going to rule over. And that made a lot of sense. And, you know, I mean, there are things to back that up. If you look over in the book of Revelation, talking about that revived empire, you know, the, and really it's an, a, a system of government, commerce, and religion. If you look at that, it's got some images that, that were used to describe that, that uh, system of government, commerce, and religion. One of them from Revelation 17, if you look at the last two lines there, is a woman sitting on a scarlet-colored beast. Now, why is that important? Well, if you went over to the European Union Parliament building, there's a mural on the wall of a woman riding a scarlet-colored beast. Go figure. The other image was of the Tower of Babel, and it's referred to as Babylon the Great, and it ties back into that. Interestingly enough, the European Union has chosen Babel as an image they identify with. I'll put this up on the screen. This is a poster from the European Union. You can see the 
um, symbol of the European Union there inverted up on the top with the stars. But then you've got a Tower of Babel. And if you look really closely over to the right, there's a crane. And if you look really close, there's a little guy up there directing its rebuilding. Now, what happened at Babel? Remember, God said they got one language, they got one voice, nothing will be withheld from them. God had to confuse the languages. Look what they put on this poster. It said, Europe, we've got many tongues, but we still got one voice. And they got the image of rebuilding. So could that tie in with the revived Roman Empire? There's clues that say maybe it could, you know. But then there's the other theory that is really gaining uh, interest. And, and, and I think this is really interesting. If you've at all unhooked, hook back in right now because this is important. But instead of a revived Roman Empire, there's people teaching that this very well could be a revived Islamic caliphate. Now, what's a caliphate? If you could think of the United States, they all came together and formed one union. Or if you could think of the European Union, many countries together forming the European Union. What is a caliphate? Really, it's an Islamic state made up of all different kinds of Islamic nations. Now, it existed for about 13, 1400 years. It was, so it was in existence. It was abolished in 1924. But if you're watching the news at all, here's an image there for you. Of, it says, ISIS jihadists declare an Islamic caliphate. It's back. All right, there it is. And now, now again, somebody said, well, what about Daniel 9.27? Didn't it say the people of the prince would come? And it was the people who destroyed the, the temple back in 70 AD. And you said that was Titus, the Roman general. It was. But if you look at Josephus and a lot of other historians, you'll find out that who he used to do the dirty work was a whole bunch of mercenary people from Arab nations, which we now know as Muslim. So it very well could be. Now, so it could be a revived Islamic caliphate. We've just seen it come to pass. There it is, right in front of our eyes. We've got it back now. Now, the other concept is if you're familiar at all with Islam, you'll know they're looking for a kind of a Messiah figure in the last days. In their eschatology, they're looking for a fellow called the Mahdi. And the Mahdi is the exact image of the biblical Antichrist. In fact, if you read the Koran and the Hadith, you'll find their description of the Mahdi from their own materials says he rules for seven years from the Temple Mount, makes a seven-year peace treaty with Israel, breaks it halfway through, makes people receive a mark in the right hand of their forehead, a mark of, um, you know, being, being committed to this. I can't think of the word right now. Um, and again, he, he kills Jews and Christians and he beheads them. And, you know, I mean, ultimately that's what they do. And that's what the Bible says the Antichrist will do. Could be. Could it be that it's an Islamic caliphate and Islamic antichrist? Never know. We'll have to wait and see. One more thought I'll throw out here. Because as long as we're talking about ISIS, we know they're very involved in Syria. That's one of the places they're, they've got a real stronghold. Well, in Syria, you've got the place called Damascus. Now, there's a, a verse over here in Isaiah 17.1. It's never been fulfilled yet. It actually is talking about the city of Damascus, and it said it's going to be utterly destroyed. It says here, the burden of Damascus, behold, Damascus is taken away from being a city. It shall be a ruinous heap. It's going to be completely destroyed. Now, why is that significant? Well, Damascus is the oldest continuously inhabited city in the world. It's the oldest continuously inhabited city in the world. It's been around for 5,000 years. Now, you think about for a minute... Adam was here 6,000 years ago. This is an old city. But God said there will come a day where this thing is going to be obliterated. I'm kind of watching that because you know what? This is Bible and it has to happen. So again, if you ever see this happen, you can tell all your friends, there's the scripture. You heard it first at Royal Oak Victory Church. <laughs> all right, let's keep going. We've got to get through this. We've got the mark of the beast now we want to talk about. Now, one thing about the mark of the beast, the, the common theory that's out there, and I agree with it, is that the mark of the beast is probably some sort of computer chip that's embedded under the skin. And again, it says no man could buy or sell without that. We'll read the verse in just a moment. But before we get into the verse, I, just want, I was on the Intel website, and there was an interesting thing here about how you make a computer chip. And one of the things it said about how you made it, it went through the whole process, and then really the, the punchline of it is we make this chip by etching. We etch that, you know, some of them are etched with chemicals, some other ways, but they're made by etching. Now, why is that important? Because if we go over to Revelation 13, 16, where the mark of the beast is prophesied of, it says here, 
He causes all, both small and great, rich and poor, free and bond, to receive a mark in the right hand of their forehead. But the word mark is the word keragma, and it means an etching. He causes them to receive an etching in the right hand or the forehead. Now, if you look at this, you can kind of go down a little bit further. You can look at this online. There's actually the computer chip itself. It's about the size of a grain of rice. It says there, when cash is only skin deep, and it ties it in with buying and selling, which is also interesting. But if you look at how they insert this, and you can see this on videos, what they do is they have this little syringe. looks very much like if you go and get a flu shot or something, but it's a little wider. They slip the little grain of ricey thing in there. It's pointy on the end. They push it under there, push that, pull it out, Band-Aid you, you're officially chipped. Now, why am I bringing that up? Because I said that it said, if we go back one screen, it said he causes them to receive a mark, an etching in the right hand. The word is karagma. But if you take that back one step into the root word, the word comes from the word karaso, which means to sharpen to a point. God not only got the etching, he got how they inserted the thing. God's current, isn't he? All right. There is another possibility here. Um, there, there's, this is a, a web called SoMark, aptly named if this is the mark of the beast. But again, it's, it's an RF, RFID ink. And again, you put your hand under here, and in two seconds it goes, and you are officially RFID chipped, whatever you want to say. So again, I think that's probably the most obvious fulfillment. Here's another one, and we're going to move quickly. These next few, we're going to move very quickly. But these are, I've saved the best till last. Some of these are just so, so specific. Again, you couldn't say this is, uh, you know, just coincidence. The Bible mentions in, in Revelation, Revelation 18, it talks about a city called Babylon. Now, we can see some things here. We'll just read a few verses here. It says, therefore shall her plagues come in one day, talking about Babylon. Death and mourning and famine shall be utterly burned with fire. And they'll bewail her and lament for her when they see the smoke of her burning. Now, three times in the chapter, you'll see this phrase, standing afar off for fear of her torment. Now, it says, actually, if you read a little bit further, it says the city was destroyed in one hour. It's going to be a great, magnificent city full of commerce and all of those things. Now, now I, I think it took coming to our generation to understand this. I mean, how else could you burn an entire city and destroy it and level it in one hour and what other generation would understand three times it being said they stood afar off for fear of the torment? Until nuclear fallout, they'd never have understood that, right? Now you come a little bit further, and it says Babylon the Great has fallen, has fallen. Now we learn a little bit more about the city. It said the merchants of the earth are waxed rich through the abundance of her delicacies. Alas, alas, that great city Babylon is a problem. Babylon doesn't exist. Again, I say, yet. Now, now, here's the thing. For years, I've read prophecy books, and they said, well, Babylon, there is no Babylon in Iraq anymore. It's gone. So maybe this is symbolic, and maybe it means New York City or something. There's still books out that say that. Or maybe God meant what he said, and Babylon will be rebuilt. Maybe. Or for sure. Here's a headline, U.S. to help rebuild the city of Babylon in Iraq. They, they and the U.N. have put in millions of dollars. They're rebuilding this thing. And it's interesting, if you read that article, it goes down through and it says, we're going to make this a huge place of tourism and commerce. Exactly what the Bible said. Again, does God know what he's talking about? Let's run through a couple of more real quick. There's an Oriental army the Bible also talks about. It shows up at the Battle of Armageddon. And again, you'll see the specific nature of this prophecy. Not only does you know, the armies of Antichrist show up at the Battle of Armageddon, but you've got this 200 million man Oriental army. Let's read this. This is from Revelation 9 and Revelation 16. <clears throat> it says, I was told the number of the troops, it was 200 million. The Euphrates River dried up to provide a way for the kings who come from the Orient. So you've got an oriental army, and the number of troops is 200 million. Now let me see if I can find my source. This is from the Federation of American Scientists, this next article. It says, China's military potential, and I'll read this. It says, with a population of over 1.2 billion people, China also has a potential manpower base of 200 million males fit for military service available at any time. Got the exact number. 
Now, if you, I don't know if you noticed this other part in that verse, but it also says the Euphrates River dried up to provide a way for the kings who came from the Orient. Not only did it hit the 200 million men from the Orient, it said the Euphrates River dried up. You ready for this one? This is from the New York Times. It says, Iraq suffers as the Euphrates River dwindles. I'm probably going to pronounce this wrong. Makumai, they shout, holding up their rusty sickles. There is no water. Now think of the accuracy. A 200 million man army from the Orient that you've also got the Euphrates River drying up. God got the army. God got the, the river. Again, he's very, very accurate. So again, just to, to run this back before we do this last point, what have we seen so far? We've seen false Christ and anti-Christian society, the reestablishing of Israel, a group of nations surrounding Israel dedicated to her destruction, the dividing of the land with a Palestinian state. You've got the temple. You've got the red heifer. You've got the revived possibly Islamic empire or revived Roman empire. You've got the mark of the beast and the technology there. You've got the city of Babylon. You've got a 200 million man army and you've got the Euphrates River drying up. Wow. Okay, let's do this last one. The last one is God describes the final generation. And let's look and just see if you think this describes our generation. He says, but of this be assured, in the last days, difficult times will come. Men will become utterly self-centered. The, the King James actually said men will become lovers of their own selves. And the word actually means to be romantically preoccupied with somebody like I would be romantically preoccupied with my wife, except they'll be preoccupied with themselves. Instead of going, ha, ah, Beth, she's so wonderful, they'll be going, ha, ah, me, I'm so great. <laughs> and everything else you see in the passage comes out of that self-love. It says, men will become utterly self-centered, centered, lovers of money, boastful, uplifted in pride, scoffing and sneering at God, disobedient to parents, unthankful and unholy, without family loyalty, and because there's no family loyalty, they become truce breakers. Well, that can be applied to divorce. It says, in the last days, people will become scandal mongers given to intrigue. They'll be without self-control, liars and troublemakers, and as a whole, they'll think nothing of immorality. In the last days, people will see nothing to love in goodness. They'll be hostile to what is godly. They'll be despisers of those who are good. Men will be betrayers acting without thought, swollen with self-importance. They'll put pleasure in the place of God, and they'll be lovers of pleasures, sensual pleasures and vain amusements, rather than lovers of God. Does that sound like anybody you know? <laughs> Look straight ahead. I'm not talking about anybody in the room. But again, as a society, certainly God pegged it. But here's the thing, while it's bad news out there, I want you to understand something. There has never been a greater time to be in the church of the Lord Jesus Christ. I mean, this is the time above any other time. You know, sometimes people say, <coughs> excuse me, sometimes people say, oh, I wish I could have lived in Bible days. Folks, listen, these are Bible days. They really are. Now, look what God said about the church in that time, the last days, people of God. He says, now the world is not so hot, but for us, he said, arise, shine, for thy light is come. The glory of the Lord is risen upon thee. Oh, yeah, go, you know, the darkness will cover the earth and gross darkness the people. Don't let that bother you. But the Lord shall arise upon thee, and his glory will be seen on thee. And the Gentiles, the unsaved, will come to thy light, and the kings to the brightness of thy rising. Let me read one more verse. This is what we can expect in the church. He said, then thou shalt see talking about increased revelation knowledge. You'll flow together, begin to walk in unity, and your heart shall have a reverent respect for God and be enlarged, talking about increased capacity for the things of God. He says, because the abundance of the sea of humanity shall be converted unto thee, so an influx of souls, that's what he said up there, because there's so many people getting saved in these last days, the forces or the wealth of the Gentiles shall come unto thee. Does anybody remember a verse in the, in the book of Proverbs that said the wealth of the sinners laid up for the just? Man, I'm glad I'm on the right side in these last days. Folks, listen, what I want you to get out of today if you don't get anything else is God is in control. We can look at the darkness. I love in, in Isaiah 60 how God downplayed that. Oh yeah, darkness is in the world, but don't worry about that. God is in the midst of his people and tremendous things are gonna happen through the church in these last days. Aren't you glad you're part of the church? Well, let's give Jesus a hand clap. <clears throat>
Amen. Well, if, if you, hopefully you enjoyed that, got something out of that. I know it was a little bit of a fire hosing. But what I want you to catch is the Bible is accurate. So accurate. Now, what we're going to do next week, we'll come back and we'll talk about what happens from here. We'll put a timeline up there and we'll discuss a lot of the things that we're going to see. Again, none of this today is covered in the book, so we will make this available to you as well. Pastor Dave. Excellent. Wow, wasn't that awesome? Yeah. And, uh, you know, like Pastor Ron said, um, if you take anything away from today, you want to take away the fact that God is in control. He's sovereign. He lives in tomorrow today. There's nothing that's happening in the world today that surprises him. And the Bible says that he is our strong tower that we can run into. Amen? Amen. That's where we find our comfort, our safety, our destiny. And so, uh, and so why don't we stand... Uh, uh, we're going to close pretty quick. Uh, you know, as um, as Dr. Ron mentioned, uh, his wife Bev is uh, she's actually leaving tonight uh, on a three-week uh, uh, missions trip uh, to uh, to Africa to Kenya. She's going to be in Nairobi, uh, where she's going to be ministering in the churches, and there's a leadership conference that's happening there. Because uh, Bev specializes in children's ministry. She's going to be teaching some, uh, some of the folks, some of the victory leaders over there about children's ministry. Then she's going to be in Kasumo uh, at our orphanage for two weeks after that. And she's going to be doing outreaches and helping to organize and administrate different things. And so we want to pray for Bev. Bev, I want you to come forward and we just want to lay hands on her. Pray the blessing, the anointing of God on her protection that God would use her. We'll also pray for Dr. Ron because he's going to be um, fending for himself for three whole weeks. Yeah. And so that might mean a lot of uh, pizzas, uh, frozen pizzas. I don't know. Anyway, I'm just... Actually, I was talking to your son and he says he cooks and he said he's going to look after you. <laughs> he said that through the greeting. Anyway, why don't we pray? Father, we thank you. We thank you for this wonderful couple. And um, we thank you for Bev's desire, her heart to minister and serve, Father, uh, both here and abroad. And Lord, as she, uh, as she uh, steps off the plane, may, there, may, may your anointing and grace come upon her. And Father, I pray that you would use her, give her wisdom, give her words, Father. May she connect with the leaders and, and, the, and, and the pastors and, and the workers there. And Lord, may you make her just a tremendous blessing. Uh, through this whole missionary endeavor. And so uh, we thank you for that. We remember to lift her in prayer. And we, uh, we give you praise for that in Jesus' name. Amen.